So firstly, quick little recap today on the market. Big move higher today. Highest up day of the year, I believe. And this is a good example of volatility working both ways. Remember that when volatility increases, not only do prices fall harder, they also bounce harder when they do indeed bounce. And this was a good example of that. Notice where the S&P 500 found support. Right at its break even levels for the year. Okay, this was the very first candle right here for the year and you can see at that level that's where it found support now as for the bottom being in there's some there's one missing ingredient to this and, and to me that's the action in oil as measured by USO oil has not bounced nearly as emphatically as the market recent history from the last few years suggests that oil will lead the market not the other way around so the concern with this bounce the last two days is that it hasn't been led by oil and that unless the dominant trend of the last few years is going to change this rally should be very suspect and actually is probably a good opportunity to get short. In addition, the VIX, while it did fall 10% today, it still hasn't gone below this range here. And as we pointed out, this range was previous resistance and it acted as support back in mid-May. So let's see if it acts as support again here in June as it approaches it. And if it does act as support again, then we certainly have not seen the bottom. Personally, I don't think we have bottomed overall on the S&P 500. I believe, like I said yesterday, we may have a bottom, but not the bottom. Now, with that said, last week we talked about the risk-reward scenario you were setting yourself up for if you chose to go long at 1277. And the market did slip about another half, half a percent to seven, eight tenths of a percent. Okay. However, it bounced about three percent from 1277. So overall, if you took that risk reward that we had talked about because we were approaching this expected support level, then it turned out, worked out pretty well for you. The key level to watch on the S&P 500 now going into throughout the rest of this week is going to be this these highs from last week at 1334. That was the most recent high. So if it fails to break above that high, we will have a lower high after putting in a lower low, which will, you know, reaffirm the most recent downtrend. So even though this rally was nice, it's, it, in the grand scheme of things, it didn't accomplish anything. We need to break above 1334 in order to really question that the bottom has, in order to really say that the, the bottom has put in, so has been put in. Now we'll see what happens, but like I said, until I see oil give an emphatic bounce and really confirm this low, which it hasn't done even though it's been up these last three days, then I'm not going to be too optimistic on the markets and I'm actually going to have a short bias as we approach some of these levels. You've got Thursday's high of 1319 is the next level and then above 1319 you've got that 13. 34 high from last Tuesday. All right. With that, we'll get to the first question. It's in regards to buying a stock on the bid. 
They want to know how do you buy a stock on the bid. You would have to quote unquote guess the bottom from prior action and enter when the stock is fading. Otherwise, you would not get filled on the bid. That means you are not actually confirming a bounce from support. Instead, you are expecting the stock to bounce. What is the good strategy for buying on the bid? And if you're bearish, how do you sell on the ask? Well, first of all, it's not necessarily guessing. There's a difference between expecting and guessing. Okay, guessing to me is just kind of closing your eyes and, and buying something. Expecting is, is taking the time to map out support and resistance on a chart and then basing your buys and sells off of that. So, for instance, you take a stock like GWBU, okay, where yesterday's low was 155. So, and it bounced from 155 back up to close at 171. So if you, you know, bought at 155 yesterday, you know, you caught a nice bounce play. Now, then coming into today, you could say, okay, since 155 was support yesterday, I expect there to be support there today. So then you would put your bid in at, say, 156, okay, and then say, all right, I'm then going to put my stop at maybe this low of 152. Now, if you look at what happened, you had it come down to 154, right near that 155 support, and it did indeed bounce back up to 164. So, you know, you could have made a nice eight cent trade off of that bounce. All right. So, while you would have been, this person said guessing, I, you know, I think it's more about taking advantage of risk reward scenarios. So then, you know, even so, if you're going to buy at support and put your order in on the bid, that doesn't mean you abandon your stop loss. I mean, you still need to have a stop loss. You still need to figure out where you're going to put that. So AGRT, let's see if we can get some examples out of AGRT. Well, yesterday's low was very far away, so that's not a very good reference point. But let's see the five-minute chart of the last two days. Well, this just isn't really a good example for AGRT. But GWBU was a good example. But the, the whole buying on the bid thing, all you do is you simply enter your order in on the bid side. If there's a, you know, if, there, if the stock is a little more illiquid and the spread is a little wide, then you definitely want to try buying it on the bid. It's not a matter of necessarily waiting for confirmation. You're mapping out support and you're trying to take advantage of a risk reward scenario. People who were in the big board chat room on Friday, I talked about buying at 1277 before you knew if there was going to be a bounce from, from this level. And the reason I s said you got to take that chance is because you won't know if 1277 is going to be a key level that we've bounced from until after it happens, if it did happen. But each time you had had a breakdown to new lows below a recent low, you know, you had, you had started to see a bounce. Okay. So for example, for instance, if you, if you were buying spy on the way down near this 1277, you only were down, you were down less than 1%. So you likely did not get stopped out, even though it did go below 1277 it didn't go below it by more than 1%. So you very likely probably did not get stopped out and you were able to catch this three to three and a half percent bounce depending on where your entry exactly was. So if you are not comfortable, you know, buying at support before you see if it's gonna bounce, then you shouldn't buy at the bid in the first place. But if you are comfortable buying at the bid excuse me, buying as it's falling towards support, like on something like GWBU today where we talked about the bounce, then that is something you can you should uh, consider. 
Okay, now GWBU, this $2 hit right here, that's completely irrelevant to me. Just a fat finger trade. Didn't really hit $2. As far as selling on the ask, it's quite simple. You just put your shares on the ask, and just like on the bid where you put it at a resistance point on on a on the ask on the ask uh, excuse me just like on the bid where you try and put the order at a support level on the way down for selling on the ask you try and put it you know a couple ticks below an expected resistance level on the way up so like AGRT the high was 56 cents yesterday so if you bought AGRT in the morning 56 56 cents would have been a good spot to sell because you know there's probably going to be some resistance there. So it did break 56 cents today. You would have got filled on the way up. Sure, it hit 59 cents. You didn't catch the top, but that's okay because you're, you're selling on the way up. We always talk about that. And the reason you sell on the way up is because you don't want to be in the stock when it makes that big dump. Okay? It's just easier to sell on the way up and be comfortable with not getting the very top versus trying to get the very top and then ending up being stuck with one of these SNPK type dumps and now you just cost yourself 50 to 70 percent because you were too stubborn to not sell on the way up. Uh, the question was not about CMG and Priceline. The question was, how do you buy stock on the bid? So if you want me to cover that, then I'll send that in for next Tuesday. This next question is regarding the difference between small cap stocks and penny stocks. And this is just all about market cap okay you can oh, and also it's personal personal opinion I mean you can have stocks with market caps in the millions okay that are trading below a dollar I mean I believe or two dollars some people might consider the price of that a penny stock for instance a stock like JSO I believe has a market cap of $210 million. So that's certainly not a nano cap stock, right? But it is priced at a dollar and four cents. So it's, you know, it's cheap, okay? Siri, Sirius XM Radio, has a market cap <clears throat> of $7.8 billion, okay? So Siri, judging by this criteria, which I just simply looked up and pulled away from a financial website. Okay. So according to this, mega cap stocks are stocks with over 200 billion market cap. Large cap is over 10 billion. Mid cap is 2 to 10 billion. So a stock like Siri would actually be considered in fundamental terms a mid cap stock even though it's at $1.91. And this is why, this is another one of those aspects of trading where it's really just unique to your own opinions. Because some of you might say, no, Siri, it's at $1.91. That's a penny stock. Others, others of you might say, no, it's a dollar stock and the market cap is in the billions. You can't possibly consider it a penny stock. Then you have something like, you know, SNPK, which gets up to a market cap of a billion. And we know that, and I think everybody would still call that a, a penny stock. Uh, ALU, that's another good example of a cheap stock. It's at $1.50, yet the market cap is still $3.5 billion. Okay, so the technical, uh, excuse me, the, the financial definition, though, is here. The financial difference is in regards to market cap. But as we just pointed out, you will find sometimes market caps can be very high on stocks that are still priced very low. To me, the differences for stocks to me is just has to do with the price. 
If it looks like a penny stock to me in terms of the price, then it's a penny stock to me. I don't really care what the market cap is. That's just my personal, you know, preference. How I like to view things. Okay, this next question, I'll just say right off the bat, it's going to be hard for me to answer because, you know, you, you technically don't ever truly, truly know, but we'll touch on it anyway. Talks about how to identify a short squeeze. Are there any examples of real short squeezes and show patterns of stocks that lure in shorts and then press them to squeeze the price upwards? Well, the first thing, before you can identify a stock that could be a potential, that could experience a potential short squeeze, what must you first look for? Any ideas? No. I mean, those are all true. You do want to look at that. But it's something more basic than that. Read the charts kind of hints on it, high price. What do you need to see? Right, exactly, toppy, very good. It, it, he says toppy, but basically what I would say is it needs to look like a stock you would short. It needs to look like a stock that looks appealing for a short trade to you, okay? So the first step in identifying short squeezes or stocks with the potential to short squeeze is to first identify a stock that looks like a good short, okay? Stocks that look like good shorts, you can assume that people are shorting them. And when people are shorting them, and that's when maybe you would check the percentage of the float sold short, like publicist pointed out. And then once you, once you can assume that people are shorting them, now you have the potential for, for a short squeeze. In general, these are going to be very high-flying type stocks, big momentum stocks, like Yeah Buddy points out, uh, high PE, okay? So, for instance, you take something like Chipotle, for example. I mean, look at this ridiculous move here in Chipotle. where it just literally was going straight up. Right? I mean, from 340 up to 420, unimpeded, okay? But then, look what you have. It actually stopped, it went through a period of consolidation, right? And, and actually downtrended a little bit here. Referring to, I'm referring to this period right here. Okay. Now, to me, at that moment, Chipotle looked like a good short because it had made a big move and then it was consolidating, so you could short it in the most recent high as a stop loss point. Now, If then you look at Chipotle, when I identified that I believe it looked like a, short, a good short, you look at these three volume days, okay? It broke out above that range. On the highest volume that it had done all year, okay? So to me, that, that was definitely, you had shorts definitely getting squeezed there. And... The reason I'm assuming that is because of how strong the volume was, okay? Previous breakouts, these were all all-time highs that it was moving towards, okay? Each time it was going up, it was putting in a new all-time high all the way up to 420. And when it was doing that, though, it was doing it on volume, you know, good solid volume, but not as much volume as on these two days when it broke out to all-time highs. And on those two days, it was after it had consolidated. So to me, you know, there was some demand that came from elsewhere, which in my opinion, it came from shorts getting squeezed. Okay. 
I mean, you take Apple, for instance. Now, Apple never, Apple never looked like a, a great short to me. But again, look at this huge volume. Huge volume here from February, mid-February through mid-March up to this all-time high where, you know, you had a lot of outside demand, of course, coming from new investors, but also a lot of this had to, uh, not a lot, but some of it, I'm sure, had to do with a sh shorts getting squeezed. Now, on penny stocks, I mean, you take SNPK, for example, you had this move, and it gave up all of its gains, okay, on two occasions. So, when this is all you had on SNPK, I mean, to me, this looks like they were really struggling with the promotion, right? So, to me, it seems like something that I would expect that a lot of shorts were getting in there because it had made two huge down moves, okay? So, it had made two huge down moves. So, anybody who wasn't short, they saw those huge down, two down moves and they were like, man, if I would have been short, I could have shorted it all the way from $0.68 cents down to $0.28. Cents. And then I could have shorted it all the way from a dollar and four cents down to fifty three cents. Like, man, I really missed out on those shorting opportunities. So you can assume that a lot of shorts are going to be, you know, floating around in a stock like S and P K after after those types of moves. And then you look at what it did here. I mean, this huge up days, higher lows, higher highs, all these days in a row. And look at how relative to Look at this huge volume, how much greater it was relative to these days here. So you clearly had outside demand coming in, some of it probably from new traders and investors, but also some of it likely had to do with shorts getting squeezed. Okay. So the main thing, like I said, with short squeezes is being able to first identify a stock that looks like a good short candidate. You need to you need to figure out where what stocks are people shorting. Okay, this next question is in regards to getting filled on a fast-moving stock like AGRT. Okay, and I believe we've covered a question like that before. Let me just do a quick search. Oh, that doesn't look like it. Okay, so I can't find it. But at any rate, some of the things you can do are putting your limit order, you know, three or four cents above the ask, excuse me. Oh, thought I was gonna sneeze, guess not. Um, so putting your limit order three, uh, you know, a couple cents above the ask, putting in multiple orders, okay? Um, and on, you know, that's for stocks like AGRT, which are moving very fast, okay? As for a stock like GPLS, you know, there's not a lot of activity on this one at all. And even on this day, it had only traded $5 million, uh, excuse me, 5 million shares. So, you know, Decent volume, but not not a ton. 
was that's not more than two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. So on something like that, it may actually be better to pick up shares on the bid, right? Now this is interesting on GeoPulse. Uh, suspicious activity here. Looks like longer term. No real volume pattern. Let's look at the time and sales on this and see what those blocks were. So you had a million share block here on GPLS at 3.9. Interesting. You had a 500k block, two 500k blocks. It was towards the end of the day, too. k 790k. So this is an interesting stock here. This would be one where I imagine there's not much activity at all right now. So, you know, it might be one where you probably need to try and buy it on the bid, like we talked about. You know, one of those kind of illiquid stocks where you're going to need to play the spread better. Let's look at, uh, let's look at what day was this? This was the 30th. So the, the million share block was on the 31st. Let's look at the day before that. Again, you had a 500K block, 500K block, 500K, 500K. So it could be some wash trading. I like that the majority of the volume is coming just before the end of the day. That's a little suspicious to me. So this is definitely one to watch and see what might happen there. As far as being able to sell it, I mean, because this person says they bought it. Now, obviously, there's not much liquidity. Yes, there is. there was the volume those two days, but the majority of it was in, a, you know, just a couple blocks. All the volume came from just, you know, a few trades. So there's not much liquidity. So it is hard to sell unless it does get promoted and it gets a nice liquidity burst. That's one of the problems with kind of, you know, just buying in when you see these blocks right away, trying to maybe front run a promotion, is that if it never comes, you're just kind of stuck in an illiquid stock with a bad spread. But back to the point of the question about the best way to getting into a stock that, you know, is moving, uh, excuse me, that seems... Oh, okay, I misunderstood the question. They want to know the best way to buy into a stock that is potentially going to rock it up and before the promotion actually starts. Okay, I see. Well, then the best way, sorry, because I, I didn't read it clearly enough. The best way is you want to buy it where those blocks traded. Okay, so like all this volume traded at $0.04, cents, right? That's where the majority of the blocks were. So you want to buy as close to $0.04 cents as possible. Because if this is actually, if that wasn't wash trading and it was real trading and somebody actually loaded up a lot of shares there, then there's no reason it should go below four cents. They should have, if, if there's a promotion coming, okay, then that should be your reference point, right? Now, why shouldn't it go below four cents? I mean, if we're going to buy it, yeah, or, or it, you know, could have just signaled wash trading, you know, or it signals that the person who bought before isn't buying again, and, you know, we don't know why they bought. It's just kind of shady. It's just kind of shady if it were to go below $0.04, cents, 
be a little skeptical of, of that. So, so yeah. Now, the other thing that's different between this and something like AGRT is, as we pointed out, when AGRT volume was starting, we talked about those wide ranges, 9 to 25 cents, 11 to 39 cents, you know, 18 to 39 cents. And what that signaled to us is the people who were buying before the promotion didn't care where they were buying. They were, they were buying in a very, very wide range, okay? GPLS, you don't have buying all over the place right now, right? So that's, again, why it's even more important to buy it as close to four cents as possible if you do want to take a risk on something like this. I will say that the blocks do seem very suspicious, but it could also be wash trading. For instance, STNT, the block seemed very suspicious as well, but I mentioned that I felt like it was kind of wash trading just because it didn't seem like that organic of volume to me, and it hasn't really done anything here since. So, you know, this is another one to just keep on watch and, and see if volume kind of returns. But again, if you're going to take these risks, you've got to understand that you could be looking at a 20 to 50 to 70 percent loss the very next day if it's not if it's not the pick right if it's not something that actually is going to get promoted and of course the example I always come back to is RARS so let's get to some charts so a lot of charts that we covered yesterday are back on the list today so that's good because we can see how they acted so ICPA didn't break above five cents. Yes, the high was five zero two, but we didn't have anything real convincing. The low was four three one. That's right in line with the support we talked about four to four four that we want to see hold. So everything I said yesterday still applies today. We need to hold support at four to four four, and we need to break resistance at five cents. If it breaks support first, then you know I would steer clear. But if it breaks resistance or holds that support level, you know then that's that's a good sign. This is a good example of maybe a stock you could accumulate on bid in that four to four four support level and then using that four cent level as your mental stop loss to the person who is asking about how to accumulate, how to buy a stock on the bid. For instance, today's low is 431. Maybe you put a buy order in for tomorrow at 432, just below yesterday's, today's low. And as long as it stays above four cents, you know, you just hold on to that. Today's high was five cents, so if you fill at 432, and you want to sell on the ask, you put your order in at five zero at, at five cents just below today's resistance, and maybe you'll fill on the ask. Okay, this this was a good example for buying and selling on the bid and the ask. Clearly established support, clearly established resistance, and you can use those levels to help you determine where you should put your bid and where you should put your ask. RARS. So finally got to close above 10 cents on over a million dollars traded today. So that's nice. However, what isn't nice is it closed towards the low, it seems like. So it gave up all these gains. And then there really wasn't much interest in the afternoon. Majority of the volume came in this one block here, which was probably just a wash trade. So, you know, after 1 o'clock, there just wasn't any real volume to speak of. Now, with that said, let's see if it turns these prior highs in the support. Yesterday's high was 105. Today's low was 105. The close on Monday was 9 cents. So let's see if that 9 to 11 cent range acts as support. If it does, we'll have resistance at Monday's high of 12 cents and then at today's high of 14.44. Above that, we then have resistance here on the high from May 14th at 16.5. What I like is the increased volume today. What I don't like is its inability to hold on to its gains and how dead the stock seemed to get after the af into the afternoon. Interest really seemed to dry up. Ulta, beautiful move here today on really high volume, broke above these most recent highs, so that's great. 
What that does, this breakout above its most recent highs, what that does for me from a technical perspective is it confirms these bottoms here, okay? Now, at this point, there is absolutely no reason whatsoever it should go back below these lows here at 83.52 and at 84.20. Now, I just want to speak on a broader topic for a second. Look at this chart. So the low on 521 was 83.52. The low on Monday was 84.20. Think about what we talked about yesterday. Any, does anybody just have an observation from what we talked what we talked about yesterday relative to Alta ULTA? Anybody remember? Yes, pennies. Thank you. Good good point, and that's exactly what I was looking for. Okay, so beating the market isn't exactly the term I would use, but it's it put in a higher low relative to the market. So what we mean by that is the S&P 500 put in a low on 518 and 521 and then put in a lower low this past Monday. Meanwhile, Ulta put in a low on 521, 518 with the market, but actually put in a higher low this past Monday. So while the market was busy putting in a lower low, Ulta was busy putting in a higher low. And what did we say about that yesterday? when we notice that. Good sign, bad sign, what, you know, what, what do we want to do? Exactly, strength, strong stock, good sign, and then we want to use that most recent low. What do we use that most recent low for? Yes, your stop loss. So you have your stop loss clearly identified. If you were buying ULTA yesterday, you were, you, you were buying around 85, 87, and you, your stop loss was only, you know, three points away, which was very close, okay? Meanwhile, you have a stock like Priceline. Beautiful move today. Don't get me wrong. Beautiful 3% three, 3 move. But your stop loss isn't as clearly identifiable because even though you have a recent low, and it is your most recent low, it's still a lower low. It's, it's still weaker to me, okay? So a low like this is more susceptible to a fake out versus a low like Ulta, which is a higher low. I put more credibility on higher lows in terms of stocks with strength. Okay, so now moving forward, there is one issue, though, and that's that it finished pretty far off the highs. So it wasn't able to close on the highs and downtrended through much of the afternoon. After 12 o'clock, really just was in a downtrend the rest of the day. Now, I do like that volume seemed to be returning on the demand side towards the close, as evidenced by the increased volume and the increased price. So, let's see now this $88 level Okay. Notice that it gapped right above this resistance level. That's great. So now if it pulls back, this 88 to 92 is, is absolutely key support. No reason it should pull back much farther than this. And like I said, this low is still going to be your key low. But that's kind of a long ways. You know, that, that'd be like an 11% drop from here. So that'd be a little concerning to me. Now it did print above these highs with today's action, but it didn't close on them. So I still say we've got resistance here in this range. From 94.90, let's just call it 95, up to the, this high here was 96.65. So Key resistance between 95, okay? Key support between 88 and 92 with the ultimate 
trend support at 84.20. From a intraday perspective, you've got th this low right at 94 from the afternoon. Okay, so if you're going to put on a trade tomorrow, you have a low at 94.11, and then you had a low here at 93.60. Those are your two key lows above that 88 to 92 range that we just discussed. Longer term perspective, the stock is just a monster. Crushing uptrend. I mean, just a beautiful, beautiful move. And, you know, they the, the bulls, the bullish trend deserves the benefit of the doubt until it, it gives us a reason to question it. I'm going to cover SPY last just because that's the broader market. When I did forget CLNO, a lot of people requested that one today. So Google, another one we talked about yesterday. And we talked about, again, how we were very close to the key lows of, of the last few months. So that while the volume pattern is bearish to me, it's going down on high volume and going up on low volume. We talked about from a price perspective, since it was very close to its lows, these critical lows above that other 540 range, that it might actually be a, you know, a good opportunity to get long using those lows as a stop loss point. So we did have the up move today. Still a lot of work to be done, though, to confirm this low. But yesterday's low becomes important now. 566.47. We bounced from there. So we established support by referencing a point at which a stock has previously declined toward that level before bouncing from it. Well, we certainly have a previous decline from 632 all the way down to 566.47. And then we bounced from it up to 581.97 today. So as for resistance, it's at today's high, first of all. Today's high also, you know, and then you have some congestion here. You've got some opens and closes and highs right around that 588 to 590 level. So above today's high, 581.97, that 588 to 590 level is where I expect there to be some resistance. And also, if you notice, 590 was a key low here on April 23rd, had a key low here, 593.84 from March 6th. You gap down, on this big gap down, it went down to 591 was the high, it opened at 590. So just overall, tons of price congestion around that 590 level. So above today's high, 590 is really key. What it does around 590, I would suspect a lot of people are going to be shorting Google on a bounce back up towards that 590 to $600 range using kind of this channel as their stop loss point on the short side. Now, we talked about that 15 minute volume today, uh, yesterday and how, okay, now, so if you look, if you notice it gapped up, what's the difference between today's first 15 minutes versus the first 15 minutes of the last few days, even though even though the volume was lower, what's the difference from a price perspective? Yes, it gapped up higher. I'm looking for more though. I mean, there's one main difference from a price perspective in the first 15 minutes, first half hour of, of today versus yesterday and the day before. Main difference that I see. Yes, exactly. It held its gains. It held its gains. So the last few days, it's, it's rose at the open but hasn't been able to hold its gains. Today, it rose at the open and held its gains. So right away, that was our first clue. Today was different. Today was going to be a different day. Okay. So if you use that signal, 
as a signal to go long, you know, you caught some nice upside here in Google, which would have translated well in the options market, I'm sure. So you always want to notice that. All right. So that 590 level, keep an eye on that as Google increases. And then yesterday's low of 566.47 is going to be the new key low. Okay. GWBU. So yesterday we said there was nothing to worry about because from a charting perspective, this chart was still very much in shape. Today, that statement needs to change a little bit. We broke below yesterday's low. Volume was higher again. It has now given up all of the gains from this move that it made. So now you got to be a little concerned. You got to be on your you got to be on your toes here. 150 guys, that's the key level. If it breaks 150, we've got this support level here at 136 and above 136, we've got the May 30 low at 144. Okay? It also closed that day at 145. So below 150, you know, 144 and then 136. Below 136, well, uh, I'd be a little nervous. You'd be talking about a pretty decent retracement from the high of 191. As for resistance, uh, it's all about that 160 level again. Now it needs to reestablish itself back above 160. Okay, if it can do that, and it needs to do that soon, by the way. I mean, we need to see it hold 150 tomorrow. Or if it does break below 150, I'd like to see it break below it and then do a really strong bounce, kind of like how it did on this day here on 521 when the low was 111, but it actually closed at 158. So you got to be careful here on GWBU. First five minutes. So volume was really weak within the first five minutes today. That was another signal that it might not go so well, just like it was really weak on first five minutes Tuesday. And you had a lot of dumping here at the close. I'm sure there are some wash trades, but you definitely had some solid dumping. So keep an eye on 150 right at the open tomorrow. D-Y-A-X. Very nice chart. Let's look longer term. Okay, this is why you got to look longer term because right here the chart looks beautiful. And you would say, man, there's no resistance. Right here, you say, wow, there's a lot of resistance right around where it's at right now. So that's why it's always important to take a step back and, and really take your time to analyze a stock. Because you may think there's no resistance if you only look at a short-term chart. So today's high of 201. Notice the congestion around that level. So we had some support around $2.00. Back in 2010, we had some resistance around 2011. You know, middle of 2011, broke above it, couldn't stay above it. Okay, so I want to see it. I want to see it stabilize above two dollars. Also, from a volume perspective, volume is much lower on the weekly chart here relative to 2011, 2010. So I don't really like that so much. I'd like to see volume be higher. Now let's break it down from a shorter term. So obvious resistance right here in this range, okay, around 190. So of course, we'd like to now see 190 act as support, which isn't bad from a risk reward perspective because our stop loss, if we're using that 190-ish level, we're talking about a 5%, you know, we're, we're right in the ballpark there, you know, 2 to 5% stop loss level. Okay, so that's a decent risk reward perspective right there. Meanwhile, if it can stabilize above two and you know test some of these highs here at 209 and 212, 
212, 214, 213. So a lot of congestion overall on the two teams. So let's just say 210 to 215 resistance above this $2 if it's able to stabilize here. And above that, you'd have these, this high here at 232, 233. From an intraday perspective, Decent volume, good volume today. High volume right at the within the opening hour. Nice volume pattern. It's traded. It's only had three down days since May 14th. Since May 4th, you've got one, two, three, four, five down days total out of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. So out of the last 22 days, 17 of them have been positive. So that's great because that tells us the most recent trend. There's clearly a lot of positive action going on. So until that changes, we assume that it will continue. And again, this, this kind of difference between guessing and having expectations Guessing to me is just not taking this volume pattern into consideration and saying that it will go higher. That's just guessing. Creating an expectation is saying, well, we've got 17 out of the last 22 days have been higher. We have three high, we have three up volume days that have been our three greatest up volume days since January. We have a stock that just broke above its recent highs. And we have a beautiful uptrend lately. So my expectation is that until I see something that says otherwise, this type of activity is going to continue. Because the market price is the only thing that can tell me what the market believes. The price and the volume pattern is the only thing that can tell me what the market is doing, okay, regardless of news or anything like that. And right now, what the market is telling me is that it's bullish on DYAX in the short term, and most recently. The most recent action in DYAX is very, very bullish. So below these, uh, this prior resistance, we're going to have trend line support creeping up around 175 to 180. Going into next week, it's going to be, you know, 180 to 185. So nice play here. GBG. Whoa, big dip right there. Not sure what happened, but what, what do we like about this? I mean, obviously a huge dip, but yes, it came back up. Just like we don't like when a stock moves higher and finishes off of its highs, we do like when a stock moves lower and finishes off of its lows. Okay, it's the inverse. It's the opposite, right? So GBG, that's exactly what we had, and that's a great sign because it tells us for whatever reason somebody, some buddies, ate up shares down here like hotcakes, and they were dying to get in at these levels. So now, let's see though, I'd like to see it, you know, it closed, so where did it close? It closed around 73, so I would like to see it then hold the base of these lows, around 68. Let's even break it down further. Okay, so this is the key low for me, 65. Because I can't choose this low because at 60 cents, that's much too far away. That's 13 cents away. You know, using that for a stop loss point, you'd be looking at like a 20% loss. That's much too far. Why do I use this low? Why am I comfortable using 65 cents? Other than the fact it's obviously closer to the current price. Why am I choosing 65 cents? Well, 
So think about this again. Remember, guys, just keep things simple. What do we care about? We care about higher highs, higher lows. Okay, when we look at a daily chart, we're looking at lows relative to recent lows. We're looking at highs relative to recent highs. So why do I choose 65 cents? This is an intraday three minute chart. Yes, I'm just looking for the simple term. It's, it's a higher low. It's a higher low relative to this low right here. That's all. Everything you guys said is correct. It signifies demand, helps you establish your risk reward scenario. You know, those, those are all good things. But in terms of, of, of what it is, is in, in its simplest form, from a charting perspective, it is a higher low relative to a recent higher low. Just like we talked about ULTA, putting in a higher low relative to this higher low on a daily perspective, GBG, this low at 65 cents, it's just on a more immediate aspect. 65 cents versus low of, of 59 cents, so you've got a higher low, okay? So below these afternoon lows of around you know, 70 cents, this 65 cent level is really key to me. Ideally, it won't creep back below that 68 to 70 cent range, but if it does, 65 cents is where I'd like to see it hold. Otherwise, I would expect a retest of this low here at 59. As for resistance, needs to claim 75. 75 to 77, high yesterday was 77, high today was 77, need to get above it. What's interesting is the low from this gap down was 77, so you know that's where 77 is coming into play. You also had a low right here around 77. Above that level, you've got a high at 82 cents, and then a high here at 84.7. AGRT. So nice action today from a price perspective, but volume was low and it still is struggling with this range right here, which was the high on this day was 53 and then yesterday's high 56. You know, it's still struggling to really establish itself above that range. And until it can really push past 56 and close above it, I don't expect to see much momentum or much volume, much interest, etc. So, need to break above that, okay? And then we can talk about this high at 62, and then this high at 66. Above 66, then you'd have 70, 75, so on and so forth. As for support, we put in a higher low, so now we can use today's low of 50 cents as our new reference point. We want to stay above 50 cents. RHCO was another one that was requested. Gen, G-E-N. Uh, you know, move lower here. Price action has stopped, okay? So that, you can use these lows right here. 163 is the key low. If you're gonna enter this trade, 163 is gonna be your stop loss. Now, from a volume perspective, you had high volume here. It showed up as a red bar, but it was really only down four cents relative to the day before. So while yesterday's volume pattern volume looks very bearish, it's not as bearish as, as it seems because all this volume just kind of traded in the same range. Sometimes I wish they'd have a red bar, a green bar, and then like a yellow bar, yellow being neutral for when volume just trades in the same range that it did the day before. Because to me, you don't have an excess of supply or demand here. You really kind of have balance, as evidenced by the price action stopping. So 163 is the key low. Enter this trade with 163 stop loss if you do buy it. As for resistance, needs to, needs to clear. You've got 
two highs, 172 today, 171 yesterday, and then 173 from Monday, and then 174 from Friday. So, I mean, really every tick here, you know, is going to be positive if you can get above it. So, let's just keep it simple and call it 175, and then 183, this high here. And then 187, this high from May 23rd, and then 194. Really, though, the key is establishing this 163 as the low. So a decent risk-reward case right here because you're not too far from 163. But overall, just a horrendous downtrend. I mean, just completely ugly. CLNL, beautiful day today. I believe this one's definitely getting promoted, but you know they're they're doing a good job, up fifty percent. You know, volume of close to a million dollars today, not quite, I believe. And close near the highs. Now we do have some volume from back here. The high was eight eight, so we need to clear that eight eight. All this volume here. It wasn't that much volume, so I'm not going to give it that much credence. So just the $0.09 cent level, $0.09, cents, then $0.10, cents, simple enough. Above $0.10, cents, you know, you're really going to be taking this one every penny because this above $0.10, cents, this one might as well be going, you know, in blue sky breakout territory. As for support, now what I do notice is aside from the morning, it was completely dead. And then you had this, you know, I'm sure they did a cross trade here, wash trade, whatever you want to call it. So aside from the morning, so on this one, if you're going to play it, be aware that if you play it, play it at the bell, play it for the first 5, 10, 15 minutes. But if today's pattern is any indication, don't be caught holding it past the first couple minutes of the opening bell because it's probably going to die off until, until you know, really, really late in the afternoon. As for support, you know, seven cents, seven to eight cents. Let's see if it can establish that range as a support level. RHCO. So today, obviously, you know, a, a bad day, just quite frankly, broke below its recent lows. Would have preferred that not to have happened. It kind of violated the uptrend that it had been on that uh, I outlined in the email I sent out. Well, actually, it, so it's creeping. It's, it's holding on to uptrend support. This is very key. Now, yesterday, you know, to me, given the amount of volume that traded, it was, it was the most volume it's ever traded, and it held up moderately well so I was you know I thought that maybe it, it had a good chance of breaking 30 if it could have just had a little bit more demand but now the problem is is we had this volume trade here which was the highest volume it had ever traded and since it went lower now what, what's the problem with yesterday being the highest volume day and the price going lower today what's the problem with it now yeah some bag holders, people are going to want out. People are going to have losses. So if it does get back up here, and that's why 30 cents, you know, it would have it done very well because now So, you know, you guys hit the nail on the head, you know, kind of bag holders, and, and that's going to be trouble. Now, the other thing that, you know, was a little concerning to me is if you take this day here, on only it only took 680,000 shares for it to go from 22 cents to hit a high of 30 cents. That was very, very good. I mean, to me, that's a low volume up move, and that tells me there wasn't a lot of supply. However, the next day, if you just look at a five-minute chart here, or a 15-minute chart, let's say, of the last three days, we had, a, we had 461,000 shares trade in the first 15 minutes. 
which is far greater than the volume that traded in a 15 minute period yesterday. However, yesterday it was able to get up to 30 cents. Yesterday it was only, uh, excuse me, Monday it was able to get up to 30 cents. Yesterday it was only able to get up to 29 cents. And so to me that tells me that there was more selling pressure yesterday than there was the day before, which of course then didn't bode well for today. Now we did, you know, we are still right on that trend line support. And, you know, 18 cents is a level that it's held in the past. Okay. So if it can establish itself, essentially all it's done is what it's done since May. And that's consolidate. That's, that's what it'll, that's what the truth will be if it just consolidates holds around here. It'll still be in play. It'll just kind of have to reset itself and, and, you know, set up maybe a future breakout. That's if it can keep holding this level. Because really, if you look from a broader perspective, it's still just kind of in the range that it's been in. Right? So that's all. So just got to watch it and see how it plays out. So I said SPY would be the last one we covered. Oh, and on RHCO, um, just disclaimer, I was compensated for that. Uh, and you can see the details in my disclaimer. So I do have a conflict of interest, uh, you could say. Okay, so SPY, here we go. Now, again, same thing we talked about at the, at the outset. Good price action today. Good price action. Now, just from looking at this chart, though, gap higher today, right? Anybody notice anything about SPY when it's gapped higher previously throughout the last 100 days or lower for that matter? Any observation? Yes, I guess that's true that it does when it gaps higher it does tend to have some continuation to it. However, the other thing I notice is eventually every time it's gapped higher it's filled that gap. You've got this gap higher here, gap filled. This gap higher here, gap filled. Gap higher here, gap filled. Gap higher here, gap filled. So gap higher, when is it going to get filled? Because history of the last 100 days suggests that it is going to get filled. Now you guys did point out an interesting thing that it kind of follow it follows it up with consolidation, holds its gains, and then does move higher. And this is true. For instance, you see that here. You see that here. You don't see it up here per se. You kind of see it up here. Now, the difference though is what you guys said about it gaps higher, holds its gains, and then moves higher. That is true back here in February. It looks true here in, you know, again in March. But most recently, in late, in early April, late March, that was not true. In late April, early May, yeah, it gapped higher, but it didn't really extend. So most recently, this statement about gapping higher and moving and then consolidating and then moving higher hasn't actually been the case necessarily most recently. And a good reason for that is what Breed points out. 
but we have more resistance at current levels. Here, in this period here, when what you guys said was true, we've got an uptrend. However, since when it hasn't necessarily been doing that, we have, oh, sorry. We have lower highs being put in place. So we, we're, kind, we're, in a, we're in a most recent downtrend. When it was gapping up, holding its gains and moving higher, the most recent trend was, was an uptrend. Okay. Since then, though, the most recent trend has been a downtrend. So this high here on SPY, 133.93, just call it 134. That coincides with that 1334 level on, SPY, uh, on the S&P 500. Personally, I'd rather watch the S&P 500. It's, it's all about these two highs, 12, uh, 1319 and 1334. If S&P 500 can't break above 1344, then, you know, you, you got to get short, in my opinion. I tried getting short today. I got stopped out. That's okay. So let's see what it does in this 1319 to 1334 range. As for support, needs to stabilize above 1300. If it can maybe go sideways here above 1300, that'd be a good sign. Okay, so good stuff. That's it. And again, no class on Thursdays, summer schedule. And Next Tuesday, uh, excuse me, no, Wednesday of next week, I'm traveling out of town. So Tuesday will be the only day that we have class next week. So just keep that in mind for if you have some questions. Tuesday, you know, since I'll be out of town the rest of the week, I'll be out of town from Wednesday until Tuesday. It's the 13th through the 19th, I believe. So on Tuesday of next week, you know, maybe we'll have a longer more extended class to make up for it some all right guys have a good night